to nominate Just myself, like if that's all right. Of course, Don't Hilarious. believe a that's word they right. tell you. Citizens, the election will proceed. Salve again, friend. I went and did it. How is it possible? Uh, you're toying with me, right? Wait. Oh. Now, I'm going to keep your secret. Oh, and if our conversations... Greetings and salutations. Ah, a new face. Galerius. Hola. Nice. Ah, uh, are you well, stranger? Have you been out in the sun too long? You seem a little confused. Perhaps you should go and see Lucretia in a clinic. Sentious, I suppose. Stability is always good for business. Yeah? And what's he going to do for me? He's nothing. Certainly, for a few thousand denarii. Nothing illegal about it. Pleasure doing business. Can I help you with anything else? Very well. gathered here to elect the city's magistrate. The candidates are Sextus Sentius Imperiosus and late nominee Gallus Galerius Pelva. Marcus Maliolus Gerges withdrew his candidacy earlier today. As agreed, we shall dispense with ballots and candidates will abstain from voting. Let's make this quick. As I say your name, call your vote. 
I'll start with you, Horatius. Sentius, of course. Georgius. Galerius. He saved the life of my dear friend Fabia. Dacius. Galerius. Virgil. The man who put a stop to the threats I've been receiving. Galerius. Ulpius. Galerius, the man who saved my life. Rufius. The man who treated my rheumatism. Galerius. Citizens, you have made your decision. Your new magistrate is Gallus Galerius Helva. What? It has been decided. Magistrate Galerius, would you like to make a brief address? Uh, I just want to say, this isn't something I ever wanted. Now that you've put your trust in me, I'm going to do everything I can not to let you down. I'll need some time to put together a list of the changes I want to make around here. But I promise you, there will be changes. My first order is that Dooley is to be freed. Horatius, release him from his cell immediately. Please. Wait, do I need to say please? I suppose not. That's it. You can all get on with your day. Nothing else to see here. Move along. Galerius won. He deserved it. Fortune smiles on you today, Julius. Magistrate Galerius here has ordered your release. You're going to let me out? I'm sorry it took so long, my friend. And it wouldn't have happened at all if it wasn't for a newcomer. So be sure to offer your thanks when you can. I will. I will. Thank you, Galerius. I'm so happy. I'd love to stay and chat, but I've got a lot of work ahead of me. Why don't you go to the baths, then tell Georges I said you could have some new clothes. Then I want you to go home and rest. I'll speak with you soon, Dooley. Magistrate Galerius said I should thank the newcomer. Are you the newcomer? Oh, it is you. Then, thank you. You're a big helper. I was locked up, but they let me out again. I'm so happy. You can have my shiny plaque if you want, and maybe you can help me find my treasure. My friend Hannibal used to look after me, but he gave me a plea. Oh, thank you. I hope you find Oh, look over there. Maybe it is treasure. I can see it for myself. So pretty. And it's just lying out here in the open. Maybe nobody wants it. Just take it. Don't you dare. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one.
you. Thank you know you're here. You have to help me escape before that monster comes back. I'm Centilla. I found a way out through the gate of Horn, but it's locked. So I told him about it, and instead of helping me escape, he locked me up. He wants to keep us all here forever, or until we're turned to gold. He's a monster. You have to let me go so we can kill him and take his key. Sentius, my adoptive father. Furies help me. I'll castrate and crucify him. I don't know. He said the gods are on his side because they don't want us to escape either. Behind me, there's an aqueduct tunnel bringing water from outside the city, so it should lead us outside. The only problem is it's barred by a heavy locked gate, and he has the only key. I'm going to take that key from around his neck, even if it means cutting his throat to get it. I'm done caring about the golden rule. I just want out. Help me, and we can escape together. There won't be enough time. Just you and me. What do you say? No time! Wait, did you hear that? He's here. Quick, you have to let me go. It's now or never. Oh, thank you. Now follow... Wait, did you hear that? He's here. He must be coming in through the door behind me. You distract him. Stay right here and keep him talking while I look for something I can use. What did you do with Centilla? Where is she?
So that is how it's going to be. Oh well, this doesn't change anything for me. It's a shame, really. If you'd just done what you were supposed to, you'd have been looping through time forever until you gave up and killed yourself. Just like that soft-hearted pleb, Al. Come now. Surely you didn't think you were the only one here who remembered everything. You see, my connection to the portal somehow preserves my memories from one room to the next. Whether that was Proserpina's intention or a happy accident, I'll never know. But I'm surprised you hadn't noticed. Here I was, thinking you were a little bit sharper than Al was. Or perhaps you're just more willing to break the rules. He was a moralistic fellow, never once compromised on his principles. And because of that fatal flaw, he relived this day many thousands of times before we finally had this conversation. I watched him come through the portal each time, always a little older, a little more disheveled, a little more haunted. And when he finally saw the futility of it all, as you're about to, it broke him. He drank a jug of wine, tied a noose around his neck, and took his own life just before he was shot with a golden arrow. The next time I awoke, you showed up. But you, you've caught up to where he was so quickly. I'd have preferred if you'd given me more time to enjoy the trappings of my success. How many extra days did you give me? Just the six? Not a lot compared with Al, but I've seized every day nonetheless. In any case, there's no escape for you except the path that Al took, the path he wrote about on his tablet. What was it? Ah, yes. Better to end it all now than find out what awaits you beyond that portal. So, you've discovered my secret. So what? What are you going to do about it? Of course, there's no way you could have succeeded. Every soul who has ever found themselves here has broken the golden rule eventually. It is inevitable. Man will always sin sooner or later. Any idiot could tell you this, but where others might see tragedy, I saw opportunity. As I told you the first time we met, I found a way to cheat death. By reliving the same day over and over again forever. And I will continue living long after your dust. Why? Isn't it obvious? Because I have grown attached to all this. My title, my beautiful villa, the sun on my face, the music of birds chirping. And as long as this day keeps repeating itself, I get to enjoy it all, over and over again, for eternity. Don't you see? I have found a way to prolong my life indefinitely to cheat death. I have become, in effect, as immortal as the gods. Can you honestly say you would not wish the same for yourself? Do you really think you can take on a Decurion with that flimsy little bow? Who? Centilla? Where is she? I'm right here, father. Ah! shall suffer for the sins of the one. Come on, we have to go. Hey, what's happening to you? That light, it, it's so bright. I was in here alone. I'm Al. Well, here I am. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Funny you should ask. I was just reading an old tablet I found here. Well, trying. 
My Latin is kind of rusty, but the last entry mentioned someone with the same name. It described an event about 2,000 years ago. Someone with your name appeared in the city out of the shrine of Proserpina. Freed an imprisoned woman named Centilla, who then murdered her captor, breaking some kind of ancient law. It said the attack caused golden statues to come alive, hunting down everyone in the city and turning them into gold. Apparently, the only person to survive was Centilla, while the stranger disappeared in a flash of light. Uh, what? You're saying you were here 2,000 years ago. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I'm sorry, come again? Um, let me see that. God, why does this writing look so familiar? I've spent a lifetime in this place going around and around in circles. This is... This is disturbing, but I don't understand how I could have written it. I, uh, I'm not following. So you're saying, because a man from 2,000 years ago is dead, he never created a time portal, so I never went through it, and that's why I don't remember any of this. I guess you saved my life then, as well as helping that poor woman to escape. That's... A lot to take in. Maybe we can escape through the same aqueduct Centilla used, if we can find it. I'm gonna pause here for a moment and make sure nobody else is ever lured into this temple. You go on ahead, and I'll be there soon.
And here you are. Allow me to introduce myself. As you have already gathered, I've been known by many names. Nergal to the Sumerians, Osiris to the Egyptians, Hades to the Greeks, and Pluto to the Romans. But the one constant through it all has been my title, God of the Underworld. And I've been watching you with curiosity, mortal, ever since your life. You're unlike the others, aren't you? And what is more, you carry a weapon that was never intended for mortals to wield, and you do it so reasonably. But there will be time for your reckoning later. First, as a reward for undoing the desecration of my obelisk, I will allow you to satisfy your curiosity. Ask what you will. My story is many thousands of years long. You will need to be more specific. What do you wish to know? My kin and I all adopted this form long ago, so that we might better understand and communicate with your kind. In time, we grew fond of the sensory delights it affords. Desire, joy, ecstasy, even rage and sorrow while an acquired taste can be addictive. It is a matter of perspective. God is a label I was given by you mortals, not one I gave myself. Your ancestors revered me because to them, my knowledge and technology made me incomprehensibly powerful, just as you might seem so to an insect. But despite all that, there are rules even I must obey. This is my beloved. Like me, she has been known by many names. Eresh Kigel to the Sumerians, Isis to the Egyptians, Persephone to the Greeks, and Proserpina to the Romans. Or perhaps you might know her as the goddess of springtime, the cycle of life and renewal. Your gaze lingers too long. That is my servant. You would have met by the river, though she wears many faces and goes by many names. Kumutubal to the Sumerians, Kurti to the Egyptians, Charon to the Greeks, and Charon to the Romans. Her role is to ferry souls between the mortal world and this one, and to make their transition as seamless as possible. For that, she earned herself the infamous, if erroneous, moniker, the ferry. We will talk more later. For now, ask your questions. No. Long ago, I swore to Persephone that I would remain in this form for as long as we remained among your kind. I must honor that. As you wish. It has come to be known simply as the Underworld, and it exists because of a wager I made long ago. That is a long story, one that began over 3,000 years ago and continues to this day. You see, long ago, my kin and I set out from our home on Elysium to search for other forms of life among the stars. We discovered your planet and witnessed your kind evolving from primates into something lawless and barbaric. You all but destroyed yourselves your two short lives being extinguished by violence and ignorance and disease. Yet Proserpina saw raw potential in you. It persuaded the rest of us it would be squandered without our intervention and stewardship. So we revealed ourselves to your people in a place called Sumer. We offered guidance in agriculture, toolcraft, and law. And you called us gods. For a time, you flourished. But soon you were too many for us to oversee. And as you spread from that cradle of civilization, we saw something disturbing. We had sown the seeds of dependency and confusion. And soon you returned to your old ways of violence and ignorance, this time in our name. My kin had seen enough and gave up on your kind, condemning you as barbaric and chaotic, scarcely more than animals. 
We began preparations to return to Elysium, our home world. A utopia unspoilt by conflict and unimaginable in its beauty. But my Proserpina could not bear to abandon your kind without guidance. And knowing it would force the rest of us to leave her behind, she made an extraordinary sacrifice. She gave up her immortality to descend permanently to the ranks of humankind. And so she began her inescapable trajectory toward death. Horrified, I acted swiftly. I placed her in suspended animation in a deep, frozen sleep to prevent age and sickness from claiming her. And then I pleaded with Proserpina's father, who the Romans called Jupiter, to bring her with us to Elysium. It was and is my hope that once there, we might one day learn to undo what she has done to herself. But he refused. I did everything I could to persuade him, but he would not relent. He would rigidly uphold his final pronouncement. Humans were unworthy of ascension to Elysium, and no exceptions would be made. But seeing that I was aggrieved, he proposed a wager, the terms of which were as follows. If even one human city could prove itself capable of living without sin for a single year, then Proserpina and all of humanity would be permitted to join us in Elysium. My part would be to remain behind, the last of my kind, to watch over me without interfering, and to sit in silent judgment. And so my reward has been to languish here, Enduring a 3,000 year winter, waiting for the day your kind proves itself worthy of her faith in you. So that I might take her with me to Elysium and unthaw my goddess of springtime. And here I am, after all this time, still waiting. There were also gods who, like me, have been known by many names. But perhaps you knew them by their Roman names. Our leader, Jupiter, as well as Neptune, Saturn, Juno, Minerva, Mars, Venus, Apollo, Diana, Vulcan, Vesta, Ceres, and of course, my beloved Priscilla. As the first wave of your kind arrived from Sumer, I had them build a city in their own fashion so that they might be comfortable and recreate their lives here. Yeah. I had them build the entrance as a vertical shaft leading to baths to cleanse them of the sins of their former lives and to prevent escape. I watched wave after wave of Sumerians arrive, and as their civilization declined over the centuries, they were replaced by Egyptians. Of course, believing themselves to be the superior civilization, the Egyptians promptly built over what had been built before, and made all the same mistakes. After another thousand years, the Greeks began to arrive, and then the Romans, and they all did the same thing. They built upon the underworlds of their predecessors, renamed their gods, and ensured their foundations were forgotten. To ensure the wager was fair, it was important that my subjects were chosen at random. To this end, I had my servant distribute a thousand tokens fashioned from the silver, a rare element at the time, across all of Sumer. Whoever died while in possession of one of them would be located by my servant and ferried to this place, with no memory of how they arrived. As the tokens were discovered, they were traded, smelted, and fashioned into trinkets, and eventually coined spreading to Egypt like seeds on the wind. Later, when they spread to Greece, they would come to be known as Charon's Oval, or as coins for the ferryman. Some placed coins in the mouths of their dead, hoping they would awaken here, though they had no way of knowing which coins were fashioned from the original tokens. In fact, almost all of the tokens are accounted for, only two remain. And so after this wave destroys itself, as it is destined to do, your kind would have squandered the last of its potential to ascend beyond this rock, and Proserpina's along with it. 
It is a regrettable story. One of the first men who came to this place was the King of Sumer and a troublemaker. To be rid of him, I returned him to his people on the condition that my servant erased his memories of this place. But the erasure did not take completely, and he told stories of this place as if describing memories of a dream. His tales were committed to writing, which came to be known as the Epic of Gilgamesh, and his words were twisted and distorted over generations. Later, the Egyptians would adapt Sumer's stories of the underworld, making them wildly intricate and labyrinthine. Their Book of the Dead and Book of Gates bore less and less resemblance to this place in their priests' pursuit of profit. Then, when the Greeks began to arrive, they proved far more cunning. And in a series of incidents that will not be repeated, five of them escaped. A warrior named Heracles, two kings named Sisyphus and Theseus, a poet named Orpheus, and a Trojan named Aeneas. They each told embellished tales of this place, how to get here, and how to escape. And so from Sumer to Egypt, Greece to Rome, your kind has always told each other stories about this place, though each story contained only a seed. Of course. That is merely the name your people have given to it, but yes, it is my doing. That is a story dating back to the very first wave. After the Sumerians finished building their city, the self-declared ruler threw a banquet to celebrate. Now this man was unmarried and many women were vying to become his wife, a prestigious position of power and influence in a new world. Of all the women, two were particularly ambitious. Both were beautiful, and both arrived at the banquet wearing eye-catching dresses and painted faces, their hair woven in elaborate fashion. The first woman, recognizing that she would require an advantage to win the ruler's affection, draped herself in jewelry, ornate necklaces, bracelets, and rings fashioned from gold. Seeing this ostentatious display, the second woman grew envious, for she had no such jewelry at her disposal. She prayed aloud to any gods that would listen to cover her in gold. And when her prayer went unanswered, she took matters into her own hands. While the others indulged at the banquet, the second woman summoned the first for a discussion in a quiet place. She checked that nobody was watching and pushed her rival from the top of the ziggurat where she broke her neck on the rocks below. But I was watching, and I decided to answer her prayer. I took the golden bow left behind by Diana, and I shot that woman in the heart, covering her from head to toe in a layer of molten gold and I left her to stand there, that she might serve as a grim reminder of what befalls those who sin in my domain. But that was not enough, for the entire city was tainted by her sin, and the wager could no longer be won. So I had no choice but to wipe the slate clean. I gilded them all to make way for a new wave, and began the wager again. And to this day, each of them, and all who came after, line the halls of this city, inanimate but conscious, suspended in time with only their sight and hearing preserved, so they may bear witness to and lament the folly of your kind for eternity, the silent golden sentinels. When my kin departed, they left behind many relics which I inherited. Consolation prize of sorts. The golden bow originally belonged to one of my kin, who the Romans called Diana. As my collection of golden statues grew, I chose the most ferocious among them and equipped them each with a duplicate of her bow and tasked them with hunting down the forsaken at my behest. They became known simply as Furies.
I give your kind a second chance at life, as well as ample warning about my law. And when you disobey, and you always disobey, you force my hand, bringing terrible suffering upon yourselves. And so you ask if I am the one destroying your lives. And I say, no, you destroy yourselves. I am merely the means by which you do it. I've always considered that the cornerstone of morality is the ability to determine right from wrong on one's own. No attempt to lay our rules like your Code of Hammurabi or your Twelve Tables of the Roman Republic can ever cover all possible scenarios. This should come as no surprise to you since the core principle has been expressed in many forms by many of your civilizations. The Egyptians made a rudimentary attempt with do to the doer to make him do. The Greeks refined it with avoid doing what you would blame others for doing. The Roman Stoics added treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. Even the so-called cultists hiding among you often say do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is the simplest of concepts, and each one of you is born with the faculties required to apply it to any situation. Yet none of the peoples who expressed this rule were able to uphold it. Curious, is it not? statues in the city. Their ears are my ears, and their eyes are my eyes. If she was still conscious, I suppose she could, but she's not. Why do you ask? Then what an odd question. Do you plan to speak in sweeping generalizations, or are you going to give me an example? I have seen no such thing, but in any case, taking one's own life is a self-directed act. It is not one that is done to others, however they may be affected by it. Therefore, it cannot be said that one who commits suicide has done anything unto others. Applying this rule always requires us to interpret the meaning of the words. A literal interpretation helps to minimize the ambiguities of your primitive language. Hmm. Supposing you are right, then my law has been broken, and I should turn you all to gold immediately. Is that what you want? desire to be right outweighs your desire to survive. You will make a fine statue. <laughs> Do you really think you can wound me, a god, with that primitive weapon? Dare you threaten her? This ends now. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one.
Salve, friend. All right. The The forty nine melodies fetch again. <laughs> ah, a fellow traveler from a faraway land. Come and join me by the fire. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I was indeed, but we've never met before, have we? I'm sure I would have remembered. Blessedly, sir, am I losing my memory? Oh, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought it was I who was touched by it. I assume you're asking me this as some kind of amusing hypothetical? Extraordinary. Then let me see if I can help you. I suppose first I'd want to gather information. I'd want to know about his reasons for imposing the Golden Rule and what he considers a sin. If I could expose some internal inconsistency in his reasoning, some degree of hypocrisy, I might be able to compel him to change his position. But as a philosopher, the saddest truth I ever learned is that all but the most enlightened opponents are more easily swayed by appeals to emotion than by reason. So the easiest path would be to find his emotional susceptibility and exploit it. If he was vain, I might try to flatter him. If he was merciful, I would try to evoke pity. As a last resort, I might figure out what he fears losing above all else, and, if I could, threaten to take it away. Though, of course, that could easily go awry. Now, go quickly while my words are still fresh in your memory. Whatever's in that great temple up there on the bluff. I can't believe 
this is how it ends. Oh no! No! No, 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 no! Wolf Pan. Uh, um. You. Well, if. if no, I am out. Wherever you are, Santilla, my love. I'm sorry. Ulpius, no! I... I can't believe he went through with it. I... Oh, Lord. I'll have to...